let us take you on a tour of innovative art around Milwaukee. On this episode of the Arts Page, learn how Shorewood is celebrating their heritage with a sensory experience of a haunting, historical, high-speed train. Step inside the studio of a Cedarburg artist who uses his knowledge of science and design to shape his watercolor paintings. And go behind the scenes with the award-winning team at Milwaukee's Florentine Opera Company to see the creation and launch of the world premiere production of Sister Carrie. That's all coming up now on The Arts Page. The Arts Page is made possible by the Helen Daniels Bader Fund, a Bader philanthropy. Honoring Helen Daniels Bader's passion for the arts and creativity, the fund brings community arts to underserved audiences and is a proud supporter of local arts programming on Milwaukee PBS. Welcome to the Arts Page. I'm your host, Sandy Max. In Wisconsin, we have artists and communities that are pushing the artistic envelope. 2017 is the 100th anniversary of the incorporation of the village of Shorewood, Wisconsin. To showcase their commitment to public art, they are creating art experiences that will bring people to their community. In the 1930s, people who lived in Shorewood would marvel at the lightning speed of the Chicago and Northwestern Railway's Twin Cities 400, a passenger train that would travel the 400 miles between Chicago and Minneapolis in 400 minutes. Through the magic of today's technology, you can relive the experience of the 400 with the ghost train. I remember vividly the smell of the diesel, you know, and the, I could hear the idling of the engine, the rhythm of the train, and seeing all the sights on the way down from a whole different perspective than a freeway. It brings back vivid memories each time I'm on a train today. Well, the village of Shorewood was um, started in 1900, or, or incorporated in 1900. Um, at that, before that time, it was part of the town of Milwaukee, and we recognized in 1900, August of 1900, and incorporated as the village of East Milwaukee. And that name stuck with them until 1917, at which point they decided to change it to Shorewood. 2017 will be the centennial of the name change to Shorewood. Public Art Shorewood is a committee in the village of Shorewood. And our purpose is to identify art and placemaking uh, locations throughout the village of Shorewood that would individually and together work to enhance the experience of living in Shorewood or visiting Shorewood. The Ghost Train is a lighting and sound installation that will be on the Oak Leaf Trail Bridge in Shorewood. The ghost train is what we call the bookend to the Jaume Plensa installation, which is in Atwater Park. It is the next of a total of 15 installations, all of which have been strategically located throughout Shorewood at portals to Shorewood. Through technology, it brings back the past. So essentially, it time folds. It time folds the period between 1935 and 1963, when the Chicago and Northwestern 400 and 401 passed through Shorewood over the bridge. It time folds it to now and in the future through a ghost, the ghost of a train. 400 was a train run by the Chicago and Northwestern. It started coming through Shorewood in 1935, was actually its first run, and those, the 400 referred to the trains that were running between Chicago and Minneapolis at that time. It cut down the number of places that they were going to stop, and it caused the, the trains to go about 400 miles in 400 minutes, and thus the name 400. The train went through Shorewood from 1935, approximately, until the early 60s. You know, I used to actually ride that train every summer. It was very exciting. Every summer was very, very exciting to travel on the train. When it would start to move, um, after, after it uh, started down the tracks a bit, I would go to the, between the cars, there was a, um, a, a Dutch door. And I would, if the top part wasn't already open and latched, I would open it myself and latch it and stand, you know, with my chin on the door. And that's the way I would travel up there. 
with the wind on my face looking at all the farmland and the woods and everything like that. But I love to just hang out the window and feel that wind on my face. And the conductors never shooed me away. They never, you know, made me go sit down or anything. They would let me stand there as long as my little leg could hold me. And that's how I enjoyed my trips to the Twin Cities. You don't forget those sounds. You don't forget the movement of the train. You don't forget the, you forget the clickety clack of the tracks and, and um, you know, the whistles and things like that. Um, to this day, I'd, if I'm stopped at a train crossing to wait for a train, I never mind. I turn off my radio and open the windows and listen for that train. The wonderful yellow and green color of the train, I think, has just made it a very memorable experience for many people who both rode it or just watched it go by. I began to think, well, wouldn't it be cool if, which is one of my big little, little starters, if we could actually make the bridge the lighting of the bridge looked like there was a train passing. That if we could have light pass across the bridge, we could emulate the, the movement of the train cars and even the movement of the windows and the headlight. And that's where I came up with the term ghost train because it would be an illusion, kind of a suggestion, not literally, but a hint uh, that there was a, a train passing over the bridge. The idea of combining public art with history is just very appealing. To actually make the, the ghost train effect work, it'll first start off with some sound effects. You'll hear the train bells, and then you'll hear the train whistle as it approaches. You'll also see some red uh, signals on top of the, the towers, the abutments of the, of the bridge to signify the approach of the train. And then as the train approaches, you'll see a glow begin to uh, increase across the bridge, and then suddenly you'll see the headlights sweep across, you'll see chunks of yellow that are moving across the bridge, and those are representing the train cars themselves. Groups of, of a lighter color on the top part of the bridge that will suggest the windows of those train cars. So that'll all be synchronized as it goes across, and it'll be followed by a little red tail light, and so this, this movement across the bridge is what's really conveying the illusion of the ghost train. The technology behind the ghost train starts with the LED fixtures. Uh, each one of these fixtures has a red, blue, and green emitting LED. Across the top of the bridge, we have 60 strings of 50 dots each. So there's 3,000 of these individual dots that we can control separately and it'll refresh those individual LEDs 40 times a second so we can get some very fast effects going on. They don't use much energy at all and they have a really great reliability and lifetime. We're going to be running the ghost train once each direction each evening as it used to basically go. The 400 was from Minneapolis to Chicago and the 401 from Chicago to Minneapolis. So we'll be running the ghost train effect roughly on the same schedule and at the same speed as the original train. We feel that it will very much become a point of interest and an attraction to not only the village, the city, the county and the state, but probably beyond. And people will then associate it with the village of Shorewood. I think it's important to keep the culture of the community alive and uh, this is this is something that every age group can enjoy every age group You can see the ghost train every night traveling across the Oak Leaf Trail Bridge at Capitol Drive in Shorewood, once northbound, then southbound a half hour later. See the updated Shorewood ghost train schedule online at tinyurl.com slash Shorewood Ghost Train. As the science of technology brings a train to life in Shorewood, in Cedarburg, Wisconsin, architect and artist Tom Kubala uses the science of design, geometry, and some spirituality in his watercolor painting. 
We visit Kubala in his studio to learn more about his process and his hope that you connect personally to his creations. I've always called painting a defensive act. When I do my first washes on the beautiful white paper, it's from then on, it's like an exercise that I repair the mistake of my first wash. What watercolor does for me is allow me to just forget preconceptions and to look exactly what's happening on the paper. And that's almost a meditative exercise, a spiritual skill, in a sense, that, uh, that allows you to see without filtering it through your thoughts. My name is Tom Kubala. I'm an architect here in Cedarburg with the Kubala Washako Architects. I've been interested in many different things, from the arts to the sciences, so I thought architecture would be the place, a profession, where I could use all of those talents. Both painting for me and architecture come from the same philosophical underpinning. The idea being to create wholeness where, where possible. So when you include a building into a neighborhood or a painting onto a piece of white paper, you're essentially um, achieving the same thing. As a professional architect, I have limited amounts of time to paint. I chose the simplest of the mediums. It's just water and some, some little bits of color on a palette. There's, I can use one brush or two. I don't, you know, it's not, it, technically it's not demanding of me, whereas architecture is completely demanding in that sense. So it's a balance, a relief from having to do architectural work. Because as you know, the building design takes years to complete where I can finish a watercolor in a number of hours and it's satisfying, you know, almost immediately. Most of my paintings have to do with landscape, buildings in landscape, some still life, but uh, most of them are from photographs that I've taken myself, of places that intrigued me or had a special kind of a quality about them where the lighting was just right. If you organize the geometry of a painting correctly, that it can produce its own inner light. It's a, a deep kind of a feeling of peacefulness, having to do with the way the light strikes objects. So what I do in a painting is not to try to replicate the photograph, but I try to pull out from just pigment on white paper the same luminous effect that I felt when I was there. This light is being reflected off the medium. So it takes a completely different set of kind of skills to try to get light to come out of a painting. It has to do with the contrast that's involved, the, the pairing of light and dark. There's a luminosity that can occur between those two colors. And so it's, it's dealing with all of that in an attempt to make this plain white piece of paper start to glow. The lightest objects in a watercolor painting are the pieces of the paper that you have to preserve throughout the process of painting. So I look at where the, where are the lightest tones within that I want to achieve and I paint those first. And that could be a very light wash, a very, very thin paint. And then I'll start layering darker and darker paints on top of that in order to get the kind of contrasts that I want. The piece that I created is called Ridges Reflected. My wife and I like to go, when we go to Door County, we like to visit the Ridges Sanctuary. It's just a little bit north of Bailey's Harbor. Uh, it's one of the most unusual places in the Door County. We're really attracted to it, in a sense, because the swales that were produced by some kind of geological event that had to do with the water, the lake, has produced these series of swales that are filled with water, then separated by land that have a very unusual vegetation on them. So it's a, a unique environmental place in the whole state of Wisconsin. But what I found interesting and why I'm attracted to it as a painter is that everything in that space is being reflected in these continuous curving pools of water. And when there's no wind, you get these fantastic reflections. As a painter, I'm always looking for contrasts in textures, so I can use different kinds of brush strokes to produce effects. And in this particular piece, the grasses become a major part of the painting as a middle ground. 
Well, there's a lot of eye movement when you look at the painting, which is to me a sign that there's something actually going on there that's more alive than just a kind of a dead 2D image. I want the process of painting to be something that I can dive into, that I can be a part of. So I'm not really sure how it's going to end up when I'm finished. So I need that the border along the edges to give me a little wiggle room and I can adjust things as I go without starting over. The last thing I want to do with the painting is make it self-expression. I'm looking for those connections that tie people together, that they, they can connect personally with the, the painting. And to me, that's a sign that I've struck on something having to do with the wholeness of that group of colored blobs on white paper. It's an interesting personal struggle to paint. It's very educational, but you have to give yourself a lot of slack and just keep trying it. Browse an online gallery of Tom Kubala's recent watercolors and see more of his paintings in progress on his official website, tomkubala.com. In the world of opera, Milwaukee's Florentine Opera Company is taking risks to bring truly American stories to the stage in English. They recently presented the world premiere of Sister Carrie, which is based on the novel Sister Carrie by Theodore Dreiser. This story of a small town girl from Waukesha, Wisconsin, who makes it big on the New York stage, also challenges the larger social barriers of the day. I'm a words away from the factory. It really is about perhaps the one remaining dirty word in America, and that is class. You know, we like to believe that we live in a classless society. But then when you look at the actual facts of the way that li lives are lived in America, it tends not to be true at all. Now, this was particularly true when Dreiser wrote his, the novel, Sister Carrie. He wrote it in 1905. It was set in 1900. And that was a time of enormous distinction between the classes. In this, we wanted to deal with the idea of class in America, women, the role of women and men, uh, the expectations for that, how you can be socially mobile or how you can't be. It's a combination of being able to do the small, very intense things with the characters and also the larger social things. The normal trajectory of an opera in, in, in the past has been the woman suffers all this abuse and then is killed commit suicide, you know, whatever, leads to bad fates. In this case, the men come to bad ends and the woman is triumphant. And so we thought, okay, two men writing about a woman and in inverting the normal archetype about uh, women in opera would be a, 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 an extra benefit to writing this story. I'm well, it's about a young girl from Waukesha, Wisconsin, who um, makes the journey from there to Chicago and ultimately to New York. And the, the social barriers and labor barriers that are uniquely put up against women at the time this happened, at the turn of the century. It's a story that doesn't have necessarily any heroes and villains. It has people who are affected by society. So it's how societal norms at the tur turn of the century affect people and how they react to that. We watch her and, and witness uh, Carrie go from something like a Laura Ingalls Wilder figure and ending up like a Hello Dolly figure. And it really does happen before your eyes. <laughs> Carrie has two key relationships and really the latter could not happen without the former. And so the, the first is with Mr. Drouet. He is a, a boss at the factory where she's working and he sees a little something a little bit different in her. You belong in places like this or better than this. He sort of invites her out, out of that circumstance by saying, I can help you get along. I mean, we can be friendly, if you like. On their own, this will be your place. And by the way, this beautiful apartment is all for you. I won't you. I'm so grateful. Through the 
the relationship with Drouet, she starts to experience more of society. And in one of those key moments, she encounters George Hurstwood. He's the, the manager at a resort restaurant. He has uh, charisma and he's magnetic. She's attracted and interested in his position and, and his standing, but she's really also um, taken with him. Hurstwood, to a degree, has become fed up with the social climbing and the obsession with nicer and nicer things. It's one of the things that has become an issue in his marriage is that his wife, his wife is a social climber. He doesn't really have a solution for it. That's the problem is, is he just is gonna try to find it in another person who seems less complicated. And I think that's what he sees in Carrie. He sees someone who's almost a clean slate. He re genuinely falls in love with her, and he sacrifices everything, his, every part of his social standing. And then he starts this kind of remarkable and very, very sad decline. But I'll take anything now. He can't dig himself out of, out of this, this terrible depression that he's in. And eventually she has to leave him while she is becoming a, an ever more successful star. So really, it's a, it's a love story about the two of them. And as much as we've emphasized the importance of class, what makes it, I think, interesting is it's a genuine and very original love story between these two people set against this large and important social background. This moment from our dream. My character's name is Lola, and she is a chorus girl in New York City and meets Carrie there. She loves being on stage, but she's very content to be where she is. I think she's really happy to be in the chorus, happy to be part of an ensemble. She loves having fun. What looks beneath the captain? They kind of bring out the best in each other. They help each other see what each other's, well, at least Lola certainly helps Carrie see what some of her strengths are. She loves her fan mail, and there's a great duet between Carrie and Lola about that in the opera. Her success is not an unmitigated success. Her independence, her success, has come at a cost. And she has not only paid for that, but she'll continue to pay for that. The Florentine Opera is run by William Florescu. He's directing the, the opera, too. He knows the kind of singing, singing actors that we love to work with, and he's cast this opera just brilliantly. The two leads are really well known for, for being great singing actors, but also having a real way with new work. Adriana Zabala, who's been with us in more classical repertory, has done a number of new works, particularly with Minnesota opera. Keith Fairs, who's doing Hurstwood. So Keith has a unique ability to create and, and sort of wrap himself around new roles. Lisa Jordheim, who's doing Lola, was a, a, was a former studio artist with us. And then Matt Morgan has just the right stage sense for, for the role of Drouet. It's a really great quartet of lead artists. We're storytellers. That's what we are, first and foremost, are storytellers. There's a lot in this story that is true to our lives as human beings in terms of the complexities and the nuances, the ups and the downs, and I think we want them to have a true experience.
You can see more photos and hear songs from Sister Carrie online at the website sister-carrie.com. And get the full schedule of performances by the Florentine Opera Company at their website, florentineopera.org. Learn more about the arts page and catch up on our previous episodes when you visit the Milwaukee PBS website at milwaukeepbs.org and click on the arts page. And please like us on Facebook at the arts page to get updates on artists you've seen on the show and share your feedback and ideas. On the next episode of the arts page, it's a celebration of painting, including the 50th anniversary of Watercolor Wisconsin a look at one of the world's foremost collections of 20th century Haitian paintings right here in Milwaukee. And did you know that even before he was Prime Minister of the UK, Sir Winston Churchill was a talented painter? I'm Sandy Max. thank you for watching and please join us next time on the Arts Page. Funding for the Arts Page is made possible by the Helen Daniels Bader Fund, a Bader philanthropy. Committed to bringing the creative arts to underserved audiences, the Helen Daniels Bader Fund encourages collaboration and innovation that strengthens our community to make our world a better place to live.